So we're picking up at the beginning of chapter 14 now. So let's uh, read through, then we'll pray and then we'll study. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, for, all, uh, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that as we study your word tonight, Lord, that you would enable me to teach your truth, enable our hearts to be humble and ready to hear. And may you do your work through your word, by your spirit of transforming us into the image of your Son. Amen. Amen. So as we come to chapter 14, just by way of uh, kind of recap of where we are, if you recall way back in um, at the uh, beginning of chapter 11, we have the uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which really ended the training of the disciples and kicked off the whole of the final portion of Jesus' life. And I said at the time that it was on the 10th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar that, the, uh, that he went in, because that's when the Passover lamb was tested. And the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb was brought in for testing on the 10th of Nisan, and that went through until the 14th of Nisan. And we had Jesus being tested, and we've had him teaching on the Mount of Olives. And now, we're told in chapter 14 and verse 1, it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, so we're literally just a few days ahead now from the triumphant entry. The uh, period uh, of being tested by the chief priests have gone, but Jesus is still proving himself and his character in the run-up to Passover. Feast of Unleavened Bread was actually a separate feast on the uh, day after the beginning of Passover, but Passover being a seven-day festival, um, it was pretty much included with it. And what we have here in chapter 14 in this little section, uh, we've got the anointing in the middle, but notice we've got a little, uh, little selection of bookends here at the beginning at the end. The plotting to kill Jesus is where we begin. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him, for they said not during the feast, for there will, lest there be an uproar from the people. And then again at the end of the text when we come uh, after the anointing, we have Judas Iscariot providing them with the opportunity that they were looking for. So we'll come to that then. Just to say that at the start here, when he, they say not during the feast, there's a good reason for that, for uh, two main reasons. One is practical and one is spiritual. The, the practical reason is simply that they wanted to be particularly careful of there not being an uprising at, the, uh, at any of the feasts. The population of Jerusalem at that time is widely disputed. Um, some people have numbered it as small as you know, 20,000 and some over 100,000. 
But the fact remains that at the times of feasts and festivals, particularly Passover, that number would swell to multiple hundreds of thousands, most likely, simply for all the people coming into Jerusalem for the Passover. And therefore, if you wanted to cause an uprising of some sort, if you wanted to cause trouble, if you wanted to ha you know, have some sort of political statement to make, then that's the time to do it because everybody's there. And so for the chief priests who want to get rid of Jesus, they don't want to do it during the feast because there's too many people there who might rise up and say, ah, uh, no, we, we like this guy or we hear good things about this guy. We don't want this to happen. So it's a very... Uh, eminently practical reason. As far as they're concerned, just time is going by willy-nilly. They're not aware of the significance of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They're not aware of the significance of the timing of these last few chapters. And so for them, it's a case of, well, let's just get Passover out of the way, and then we can worry about having him killed afterwards. So we see that there is the intent for them to kill him, but they're certainly not planning on doing it during the Passover for that practical reason. I think though, however, there's probably a spiritual reason as well. We understand that Jesus died for us and he died for our sins, and specifically, he died for us at Passover because he is our Passover lamb. He fulfills the feast of Passover. And Though it's not necessarily the main focus, and certainly I'm not sure Mark is making a huge point of it, but, you know, it seems to me in the Gospels generally elsewhere that there were other opportunities and uh, desire for Jesus to be killed. If you remember, Herod was... Uh, motivated to kill all the, the young babies in Matthew's Gospel to try and have Jesus killed in the, in the midst of that mass slaughter. Um, in John's Gospel in chapter 8, the, uh, the Jewish leaders tried to have him killed by stoning when they consider him to be blaspheming. And Satan doesn't seem to have a problem with having Jesus killed. But he does have a problem with Jesus dying at the right time at Passover, and in the right methodology on the cross. And I don't think that uh, it was Satan's plan to, for Jesus to die at Passover. It was very much his plan for Jesus to die at any other occasion and in any other way. But uh, it seems that there is perhaps, and I say perhaps, not everyone agrees, but there's perhaps a spiritual reason behind the desire for them to wait as well. And so, with the text, uh, Mark very much focused on the uh, planned death of Jesus. We now go from them planning, them planning and their timing being what they want, to God's planning and Jesus' planning and it being what God wants. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table and a woman came in with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and she poured it over his head. This uh, perfume was known as nard or spike nard, to give it its full name. And it was, as he says, very, very costly. And we'll We'll see just how costly it is a little further down. After it's been broken over the head, if you look a little bit further ahead, we're told, they said the anointment could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. 300 denarii, well a denarius was a, was a day's wage. So 300 days wages is essentially getting close to a year's wage for a common laborer. So for, for the average person there, that one year's worth of wage. And it was a huge expense. You think what you earn in a year, and you take that sum of money, and you think about spending that sum of money on one thing, not one thing that will be used for the next year, or two years, or ten years, but one thing that's used at one time, at one moment, and then is gone. This is a perfume. You break it, you pour it out, the smell is there, and the smell fills the room, and once that smell is gone, it's gone. It's over. So you imagine a year of your wage 
That's what was being spent here. And often in uh, that culture, because it was so costly, people would only ever use it once in a lifetime. And typically that was reserved for the wedding day. In the Song of Songs, uh, Shulamit, the, uh, the uh, bride in the Song of Solomon, was uh, anointed with per- that same perfume on her wedding night as well. And so for her, uh, this was a huge cost. Now, the breaking of the flask, it may well be that it was sealed and that she may have needed to break it to open it, but it seems a little bit more than that, that perhaps in the breaking of the flask, there is this, um, there is this statement of, I'm not just opening it or, or, or nipping the top off and putting a little bit on. This is broken. It can't be used again. It is all in. It is all on now. That's the, uh, the, pretty much the statement that's being made here. And so this, uh, this pound of nard is poured, a large amount of perfume poured over her head, and the respo- uh, po- oh, sorry, poured over his head. And the response of some of the disciples in verse 4 is, why was the ointment wasted like that? Again, the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 nari and given to the poor. Now, what's interesting here is in John's Gospel, there's a particular focus on Judas being the one raising the issue. And of course, the reason for Judas raising the issue is simply that, is that he wants the money for himself. He's been stealing from the, from the, uh, the pouch, as it were. Um, but Mark here that has the focus on some. There's not a focus on one disciple. And it, I think it would be a bit mean of us to uh, presume motive. We know Judas's motive, but with the other disciples, we don't. So when Judas, who wants to keep the money for himself, says, hey, this isn't much good, this should have been given to the poor, we know Judas's motive. But if the others say, you know, you've got a fair point there, Judas, we don't want to presume their motive as being negative. Maybe they were concerned. You imagine being in a ministry situation and having a year's worth of wages being spent on one extravagant thing. You know, a lot of people, you know, that's why we have financial boards of charities to prevent, prevent that kind of thing from happening. You know, this is, this is something that people could legitimately say, not understanding, could say, you know, what a waste, why are we doing this? How can this be? This is a bad thing. It's not that it was uh, something that they could be an uprising about, because of course it was her ointment and her money, but it just seemed like a bit of a waste to them. And... I think they would have much rather that they had the funds for the ministry of Jesus and they perhaps like the Jewish leaders are expecting it to go on for some time longer. So Jesus' response in verse 6 is, he says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Well, there's a lot here in the response, and this is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. I think the first thing I'd like to note is simply this. We tend to read this, I, I, I know sometimes I tend to read this in a bit of a kind of Bible voice, a King Jamesy voice, you know. So Jesus says, leave her alone, you know. And, and I just think that the nature of the words, the command, implies a bit more vigorousness, perhaps, in what is being said here. Sort of, leave her alone. No, he says, no, stop. Don't you, don't you criticize this woman in her moment of righteous glory, in her moment of, of pouring out and doing the right thing. In this moment, don't you do this. Leave her alone. And so I think that the response, at least initially, I read it anyway as somewhat more forceful. What, why are you hassling her? Leave her alone. So it seems as if there's an indignation against her they say, said to themselves indignantly. And I don't think that means they said to themselves in the sense of they're just kind of like, you know, internalizing it. They're saying it amongst each other and 
He could be, that she could be aware. This would, this would be a negative response to her moment. And so then, he says that to them in response initially, the couple of things. Firstly, he says that she's done a beautiful thing. And again, we've got our little bookends here. She's, he says she's done a beautiful thing, and in a little while he'll explain why it's a beautiful thing. But in between, he focuses on their complaint. And what he says with regards to their complaint, their complaint, as you, as you recall, is that, they will, um, is that the money should have been spent on the poor. And Jesus' response is, he says, for you always have the poor with you. Whenever you want, you can do good for them but you will not always have me. Now, this is one of those verses that's often taken uh, conveniently out of context. And specifically, it's taken out of context just to mean, you know, well, giving to the poor isn't that important. Um, you know, it's not something that is that big of a focus. And that's not what Jesus is saying at all. In fact, to understand the real import of what Jesus is saying, we need to understand what he's quoting. And what he's quoting here is Deuteronomy 15 and verse 11. I mean, in Deuteronomy 15, we have the passage in the law that deals with the sabbatical year. The sabbatical year. And every seven years, just as there were six days and then a Sabbath, every seventh year was a sabbatical year. And one of the things that happened in the sabbatical year is that if you owed somebody, or probably best express the other way, if somebody owed you a debt, then they were to forgive you that debt on the sabbatical year, on the Sabbath year. So in that context, in Deuteronomy 15 and verse 7, it says this, if among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Yahweh your God is giving you, so if you've got a situation where one of your community is poor, in need, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. In other words, you don't leave someone in need if they're in need in your community. What you do is, you say, is, is here you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need. So what you're going to do is you're going to give him what he needs and there will be the implication that he will then pay you back when he is, whenever he is able. And the extent of this borrowing is quite clearly in verse 8, whatever it may be. So the, the provision is sufficient for need. It doesn't matter if that's a little or a lot, the need needs to be met. That's the important thing. And then in verse, verse 9, there is this warning. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye looks grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cries to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. In other words, there's a command to give to somebody who's in need, to lend them the money that they need to meet the need that they have. That's the command. But if you did that in the first year of seven, then that person's got six years to get their life a bit more in order and to pay you back. But if you do that on the fifth year or the sixth year, and it's a, maybe at the end of the sixth year, it's approaching the seventh year, there becomes an ever-increasing danger that you're never going to see that money again. Here you are, here's the money. Oh, it's, it's, it's going to be the Sabbath year in a month. And all, you, all that happens is that month goes by and boom, the debt's gone. It's over. And the warning here is, don't you be worrying about that. You have to do what's right and meet the need. Does that mean that you may not get the money back? Yes, it might mean that, but you do it anyway. And you've got to be careful and guard your heart against that specific thought that might en encourage you to hold back from giving to your brother. And the danger is, is that the person who, um, who is being having the needs withheld from them, where are they going to turn? They're going to cry out to God. And there's an interesting dynamic here, you know, just in that, in that 
in, in relationships generally, in that the person who is hurt, the person who's been treated badly, the person who's in need, the person who, who is struggling in any way, shape or form, that person cries out to God. Now we as people love to take things and situations into our own hands, but when we go to God, then what we're saying is, God, we're going to allow you to deal with this. And God is warning them and saying, look, if you think you're clever that you're going to avoid paying this person, you be careful because they might cry out to me and then you've got me to deal with. And then he goes on and says, you shall give to him freely, verse 10, your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake. Remember that under Mosaic law, there was the blessing of prosperity if the law was kept. And therefore, it made, it made no sense at all to withhold from someone when the law was telling you to, because then you weren't going to get blessed. In, in, in essence, it's almost uh, an investment of sorts. You do what the law anticipates you should do, expects you to do, commands you to do, and then you will get blessed for that. And so there is a blessing that comes when one... Uh, does what they're supposed to do for the poor. And then in verse 11, we have the phrase that Jesus is quoting, or alluding to at least, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. There's not going to be poor people in year one and poor people in year two. But when we get to years five and six, then suddenly there's not going to be any poor people. There's going to always be poor people. So this command to give is always going to exist. Therefore I command you, you shall open wise your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. So, with all of that said, in the context of Mark 14, it is ridiculous to suggest that Jesus alluding to that passage is somehow saying not to be concerned about the poor. Jesus is referring them to the law, where specifically it says that they must give to the poor. But here's the interesting thing, and here's why I think there's this link and this reference, is that Jesus is referring them to a passage that specifically says, look, you just got to do what's right and not be concerned at your loss or the financial consequences for you. You've just got to do what's right, what you're commanded to do. Just do what you're supposed to do and trust God for the, the consequences, the circumstances. And isn't that exactly what this woman has done? See, what Jesus is doing is he's saying, look, we know that we're always going to have poor people with us, but we also understand that we need to be doing the right thing with our finances, regardless of consequences. What this woman is doing is while she's not specifically giving to the poor, she's very much doing the heart of what that passage was speaking about, in that she's not worried about keeping her money for herself. Her only concern is obeying God. And what's fascinating to me, and I'll mention this as an aside here, What's fascinating to me is, and I love how these things are structured, and this is where the individual Gospels get so fun, is that before we came to the Olivia Discourse in chapter 13, chapter 11 and 12, was real, I mean 10, 11 and 12, was really dealing with, uh, no sorry, 11 and 12, was dealing with the, dis the, the cursing of the temple, the end of the temple, the destruction of a temple, and then we kind of, that led us into the Olivia Discourse with them asking about the temple, being destroyed. And the last thing before the Olivia discourse that we had at the end of chapter 12 was there was a woman who gave all that she had and put it into the temple. So the whole of 11 and 12 is about the temple about to be destroyed and then God lifts up this poor widow who puts all that she has as an offering into the temple that is about to be destroyed. Now we come from 11 and 12, the ending of the temple, to chapter 14, where we're now 14 and 15, about to begin with the ending of another temple. The Spirit had already left the temple in chapters 11 and 12, which is why it was about to be destroyed. 
but there's another temple in which the Spirit of God dwells. And that temple is about to be destroyed as well, but for very different reasons. And once again, a woman pours out all she has onto the temple that's about to be destroyed. So Jesus is now really showing his role in taking over. The old temple is gone, it's about to be destroyed, but now there is this new temple that's going to be replaced. The old temple with its sacrificial system is going to be gone, but now there is the new Passover lamb that will replace that once and for all. You can see this transition that's happening between the two, and these two women fulfill that role. And uh, we know from elsewhere, we know from in John's Gospel, that this woman is in fact Miriam the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But Mark hasn't involved us in their story, and almost it seems to work better for him to have these two anonymous women. And that will become clearer, I think, in the next couple of verses. And, And so we have this woman who takes this extravagant thing, this huge sum of money, and pours it all over Christ. It's a beautiful thing. And their concern for the poor is not a valid one. She, like those who are commanded to give to the poor, has held nothing back. And then Jesus says, you're going to have the poor, but you won't always have me. And that leads into, she has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. Now, in John's Gospel we see the development of the story, the close friendship between Jesus has with Lazarus and Martha and and, uh, and Mary or Miriam, if you take the Jewish name as I'm doing here. Um, Oh, by the way, just just as an aside, Mary and Miriam is the the same name. One's a Jewish one and one's our Anglicanized version. So, Um, but with, 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 with Martha, Mary slash Miriam, you've got this family who's developing story, who's responding to Jesus in different ways, and it's part of that. But by Mark keeping these two women, the widow and her mite, and this woman here anonymous, what he's doing is is quite powerful. Because firstly, what he's doing is he is raising the, the status and the value of women over how society at that time viewed them. In a woman, with, with her testimony was not even a valid If you needed a couple of witnesses, then you needed a couple of men. You couldn't have a woman. It wouldn't count. And we're going to see when we come to chapter 16 that again Mark is going to use women as witnesses and and raise uh, the value of them compared to how society viewed them. And and, uh, here with this woman, she is performing a function that the disciples who lived with Jesus, followed Jesus, listened to Jesus, studied with Jesus. They were his constant companions. They were there the entire time. And three times in Mark's Gospel, he specifically says to them, I'm going to die. And they don't get it. And the whole lead-in to the last chapter was the way they asked the question, because they didn't get it. They didn't understand. They saw the kingdom coming still. They didn't see that uh, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus had to happen. They just couldn't see it. Like that blind man that Jesus healed, they got partial sight, but they couldn't fully get sight. They weren't blind like Israel was blind, but they had blindness of a sort as well. But the woman can see. She sees. She has understood and she has heard and she understands what's going to happen to Jesus. And so unlike all those dumb disciples, as we called them a few chapters back, that has been such a focus, their blindness has been such a focus of Mark's gospel, this woman is one who sees. She, not they, she is the model to the reader. She is the model to the reader of how we should be, that we should see see what Christ has done, and respond in the same way as her. An outpouring of all that we have. That's the right response. 
And we've seen that in our Sunday morning sermons recently as well, as we've considered Isaiah and Ezekiel, that these, these guys just got to see, and uh, the response to seeing is the outpouring of the totality of their lives in commitment to God. This woman is simply being a model of that for us, that the impending death of Christ to atone for her sins means that the anointing that she did with perfume was worth every penny of it. And I think that, uh, that you know, uh, many cultures would have the embalming for death, but the Jews, they use perfume and spices, partly to cover up the, the odor of death, the decay of death, but partly because it was a sign of love, it was a sign of honor to the person. A person is going to die, then there is this, when they, sorry, when they die, there's this, this covering them with perfume and, and spices just to honor them. And this woman was taking the opportunity to honor Christ, to exalt him, and in doing so, showed her understanding to be so much more superior than the disciples. And Jesus ends that section by saying, truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world, it, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And I guess being here tonight, we are part of fulfilling of that prophecy. That here we are talking about Jesus sharing the gospel of Mark and as we talk through the good news, then this woman becomes part of that story. The example of wholehearted outpouring before Christ. I think there's an irony here though as well, in a sense of on the one hand, he's saying, look, if you took all this money and you gave it to a poor person here, poor person here, poor person here, it's not known, it's not seen. But this extravagant outpouring now becomes something that is a statement that can always be seen. And it's not as if the disciples and their lives are going to be forgotten and she's remembered. I, I think the irony here is almost that they're so keen on, you know, am I going to sit at the right hand? Am I going to sit at the right hand? They're so keen on themselves being lifted up that Jesus is now putting them in their place and saying, look, she's the one who got it. She's the one who is going to be lifted up. Her memory will be kept. And of course, we know their memories are kept as well, though as much for their failings as for their successes. But here she is going to be remembered for this act. And then when we come to verse 10, we have the, the other end of the bookend, the plotting to kill Jesus either side of this anointing. When Judas, when Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, and he hasn't really been as much of a focus in Mark's gospel to this point, but here he is now, and he... Uh, goes to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. They're looking for an opportunity. We saw that at the beginning of the chapter. And Judas gives them that opportunity. They, they needed Judas really for three things. Practically, they needed someone like Judas for three things. They needed to know where to arrest Jesus. Obviously, they knew who Jesus was. They could recognize him. But they needed to know where to arrest him. Where, where, where is he going to be? Where can we go and get him and arrest him um, without too much public attention. Secondly, there needs to be an accusation uh, of a crime, and here's the key part, under Roman law. As far as they're concerned, Jesus has broken all of their laws. But if they want him to die, the Romans have got to do it for them. So he needs to have broken Roman law. And so Judas must have come and... Uh, it's kind of a, an assumption really behind the text here that G Judas at some point must have brought an accusation uh, to them so that they can go and arrest. And once he's done that, there is a third requirement of him, which is to be a witness at that Roman trial. But that he did not fulfill. And yet it went ahead anyway. We're going to see there's lots of irregularities that happen with the uh, trials of Jesus. 
but uh, he doesn't go ahead and do that. But that's why they needed an inside man. They needed some help because they need to look for a way. Remember, that's what they were saying in verse 2. They're seeking. How are they going to arrest him? How are they going to arrest him and how are they going to kill him? <coughs> they want to arrest him. They want to arrest him quietly and they want him killed. But they can't kill him. They're going to have to get the Romans to kill him. How do they get him arrested so that can take place? And then Judas who is upset by what has occurred, he steps in here and he gives them this opportunity. They're going to give him money and therefore he seeks an opportunity to betray Jesus. He's now made the agreement. An agreement has been made uh, to hand Jesus over. Now it's simply looking for the chance to do that. What's interesting about Judas here is this that we know that Judas wanted the money for himself. This money has now been... This woman has now poured this out. And he is somehow... Um, the way it's, it's, it's sandwiched together here, he's somehow offended by this waste of money. He doesn't want people taking their money and the followers of Jesus and spending it on perfume. He wants the followers of Jesus giving the money so that he can sift it out. And so there even seems to be an anger and a frustration in Judas. He's um, upset that his purposes and his desires have been thwarted. And as such, he is now prompted to take that final step and to respond. And so in between and all of this, this is what we have. We have the, the leaders plotting and we have the leaders getting what they wanted, the opportunity to put Jesus to death. And while we have those bookends of the enemies of Christ coming together to put him to death, as if somehow they've got control, somehow they've got this opportunity, somehow they've got, they've got the, the, the will, and, and they can make this all happen, right there in the middle, you see God sovereignly in control. Yes, Jesus is going to die, but God is going to do it. He's going to do it in his time, in his way, and for his purpose. And so we see that even in the death of Christ, even when the Jews did seek to have him killed and are responsible for his death, and yes, the Romans did literally kill him and they are responsible for his death, that in the midst of all of that, God sovereignly controls all the circumstances for his purpose and for his glory. And right in the midst of it all, we have this woman, Mary, Miriam, who... Mark presents to us as just this woman, this wonderful woman who gave everything that she had for the sake of Christ. When we understand, I was really impacted by just the, uh, what we've been doing on the mornings going through Isaiah last week and just, just here's Isaiah seeing this amazing vision. And then immediately after that vision, he, he introduces the theme of the child. And the child is the king that is to come. And then he, this child's king is seen as a servant. And, and Isaiah just develops this theme. And we re realize that the one who's on the throne, high and lifted up, is a man who is born, becomes a king, and then is sacrificed. And yet at the same time as being man, he's God. And there is this sacrifice that he makes to atone for the people. The same word atone in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah's sins are atoned for, is used in chapter 53, where the sins of Israel are atoned for by the sacrifice of the servant. And when the woman sees it, when she sees who this is and what's going to be done, the right response is an outpouring of all that she has. Do we see the child king, the servant of God, high and lifted up on the throne? Do we see him becoming a child, becoming man, dying on the cross in our place for our sins? 
And are we, in response, prepared to pour out all that we have for his sake? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the example of this woman. May we not be like Judas in the world, distracted by the world, loving the things of the world. But may we have our eyes on another kingdom. May we see as this woman saw. And may we pour out upon you all that we are and all that we have. For your glory. Amen.